Good morning. It's great to see everyone here today in Maryville. Welcome everybody in Knoxville. We're one church in two locations, and so we're excited to dive in. If you've got a Bible, let's go to Luke chapter 5. We're actually working our way through the gospel of Luke, and so today we'll be in verses 1 through 11. There's a country uh, song by Trace Adkins called Just Fishing, and the song is about how he's taken his daughter out to fish, but it's way more than just fishing. Uh, He's teaching her about life. He's building a relationship with her. And so that's kind of what the song is about. The chorus goes like this. And she thinks we're just fishing on the riverside, throwing back what we could fry, drowning worms and killing time. Nothing too ambitious. She ain't even thinking about what's really going on right now. But I guarantee this memory's a big one. And she just thinks we're fishing. I love the, the, the song. I love the idea. And In our text today, it shows us the genius of Jesus. I mean, when you think about Jesus, yes, he is God uh, in human form, but sometimes we forget the the, the genius of who he is and what he did. And this story might be familiar to you, but how he teaches the disciples in this story and how he teaches us today uh, shows us that, that he's doing way more than we often give him credit for. I mean, Peter thinks that they're just going fishing one day uh, with Jesus, but Jesus is doing something greater than drowning worms and killing time. He's calling his man to obedience. He's calling his man to a life of faith so that that he can change the world by joining God's mission. And so if you have your Bibles in Luke chapter 5, we'll start in verse 1. And the reality is God is calling each of us to be a part of his mission and so we, we want to understand how we get involved. How, what is our role in, in this overarching plan that God has in the world? We'll start in verse 1 here. It says, One day, on, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genereset. So one thing that I want to uh, point out is that people are hungry for the word of God. People are hungry for the word of God. Uh, They were so interested in what Jesus had to say. They were so interested in the words that he was teaching that that they were pressing in on him and and, uh, led him to kind of get in the boat a little bit outside of the shore to begin to teach. And so let's just pause here in in, in this case and recognize just how valid that is for us today. Uh, when we would go on vacation to this one particular area in Florida, uh, our kids, uh, we, we would take our, our kids to this big area where they had this huge lake and around the lake, they kind of had this boardwalk and shops and, and ice cream and restaurants and all that kind of stuff. And so we'd walk around there and eat and, and there's lots of fun things to do. And as, as we would go across the bridge, there was always that, you know, drop your quarter in there and get this gross fish food. And then you would, you know, throw the gross fish food into the, the, the fish and, and then you would watch them eat it. Our kids always wanted to do that. How many of you know kind of what I'm talking about here? Anybody? Okay. So those fish were always hungry. They were never not hungry. <laughs> there was never like thousands of them coming to try to fight over the food that we give them. And so I, I think when I, I think about how people are hungry for the word of God, I, I'm reminded that sometimes we get into the habit of thinking that, that there are people that are they're just simply not hungry for God's word. We just kind of fall for the temptation and assume that people don't want to hear it. Now, granted, there are a lot of people that hate God and hate the church, and there's a lot of um, anti-Christianity happening in our culture, but um, but I want us to pause because we don't want to get in the habit of thinking that way. If we get in the habit of thinking that, then, then it's going to prevent us from sharing the gospel. It's going to prevent us or scare us from, from actually talking about what Christ has done in our life. And, and, and there are a lot of Christians who I would say are afraid to talk about the Lord. They're afraid to invite people to church. They're afraid to even talk about their story even. And so when people ask Simple questions when you're at work tomorrow. Hey, how was your weekend? Oftentimes, we don't say anything about church. We just talk about what we did Friday night or Saturday. But almost every week, God gives you the opportunity to influence people with the gospel because at work, people say, well, how was your weekend? 
And in that moment, you could, well, church was awesome, and this is what happened, and this is what I'm learning. And, or you can bring God into the conversation. Folks, heaven and hell are real, and people are going there. And we have to recognize that. And even though you might see a lot of people in our culture who claim to hate God, there are millions of people who are hungry for the word of God. They're hungry for encouragement. They're hungry for truth and clarity. They're hungry for direction. In my experience, I see it every single week, this hunger for the word of God, for truth, for understanding. People are lost, they are hurting, and the world cannot provide answers, right? Nothing works in this world. And so we wanna be reminded, even in this one verse, that there are people who are hungry for the word of God. Some of you are those people. Let's keep reading in the story. Verse two. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets and getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. He asked him to put out a little from the land and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. I love this story. You and I are a lot like Peter. When the Lord tells him or asks him to go out for another fish, you know, go out and drop the nets, uh, Peter was reluctant to follow Jesus. He was reluctant to be obedient and, and to do what Jesus was calling him to do. So if you're taking notes, I think we struggle with this too. You're reluctant to obey your calling. You're re re reluctant to follow through. You let things distract you and get in, in, into the way of what God's calling you to. And as a result, you, you're just not obedient. I, I'm the same way. I love the movie Forrest Gump. I don't know if you remember that movie. It's a, been a while, but in the movie, the, the drill instructor said, Gump, what's your sole purpose in this army? And his response was, to do whatever you tell me to do, drill sergeant. There's some husbands in the room. That's your response every day. What are you doing in there? To do whatever you tell me to do, right? The, the drill sergeant said, you're a genius, Gump. You're a genius. <laughs> what would it look like if that was kind of our mentality when we read the word of God? What was that, you know, that mentality that we would be, whatever you tell me to do, Lord, that I will do it. I will follow you. I will try new things. I will step out of my comfort zone to do the things that I feel that your spirit is leading me to do. But so often we're reluctant. We resist the Holy Spirit in our life. We resist to follow him and to do the things that he's calling us to do. Why? Why do we resist? I think there are similar ways to how Peter uh, responded. And I think it, it kind of applies to our life as well. I think one thing is he was exhausted. He said, Master, we toiled all night. Toiled, we don't use that word much, but it means we worked all night. And, and I'm really, really tired. And I think that gets in the way of our obedience as well. He had finished washing his nets. He was done. You know, if you're a full-time fisherman, this was his job, this is how he fed his family. And so you had to take care of the nets. And so once you went fishing and you were done, you would bring them in, you would clean them, you would do everything to, to, to get them prepared for the next day, you fold them up really nice. And once you went through all of that trouble, you didn't want to drag it out again and, 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 and go out. It was like, I'm tired. I, I, I've already 
you know, been working for so long and I think he's exhausted and I think some of you are exhausted. And I think because you're tired, you are reluctant to do what the Lord wants you to do. Listen, Satan doesn't have to tempt you with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He just needs to get you tired. Because for some of us, if we're working all week and we're exhausted building our kingdom, then when it comes to our spiritual life, it's like, oh, Lord, I'm too tired to to serve people. I'm too tired to care about what's going on. Lord, I'm too tired to to step out and help people. Right? The Lord just needs to to invite you to obey, and and then your reluctance kind of steps in. It's just like, I'm just tired. I've run the kids around all week. All I want to do is just sit and listen. I just want to do the religious routine and just go to church and check the box. The invitation is given, but we don't follow through simply because we exhaust ourselves throughout the week, building our kingdom, neglecting the kingdom of God. Now, if you didn't bring an amen, you might just need to bring an oh my. That one hit me. Second thing I think that happens is we get discouraged. We toiled all night and we took nothing. That means we caught no, we didn't catch anything, right? So he's discouraged. He's disappointed by what he has just experienced. He'd been fishing all night and didn't catch anything. Now, there are some fishermen in the room that can relate to this, right? You're excited, you know, it's Friday night. You're gonna take your son or your daughter or you're gonna take a friend. You're gonna get up at the crack of dawn and drop your boat in the lake, right? You're gonna go out on Fort Loudon. You're gonna go catch some fish and it's gonna be a beautiful day, right? You pack the cooler, you're all set. You go out there, you fish all day and you don't catch anything. Now, just be honest, you're gonna be discouraged. You're gonna be disappointed. You're gonna come home and you're gonna try to have a positive attitude. You're gonna tell your wife, well, at least we were out there having a good time. But inside, it sucked. Inside, you're discouraged. And so this is Peter. This is his profession. He's feeding his family like this. He didn't catch anything. He's exhausted and now he's discouraged. Again, Satan doesn't, he doesn't have to tempt you to be an atheist. All he needs to do to deem you ineffective is discourage you. If you're disappointed, if you're discouraged with life today, the temptation for you is to be useless in the hands of God. I think sometimes we get discouraged and we just lose motivation. We lose motivation to do the right thing. We lose motivation to go try something new. We lose motivation to trust in God. We get embarrassed about something in our life and so we don't wanna be around people for whatever reason. We get discouraged and we just wanna isolate ourselves. And now the, the greatest part of your day is getting in your flannels and getting in bed. It's like, where, where is the draw to the mission of God when the greatest part of our day is to be alone? I don't wanna serve people. I don't wanna be around people. I don't wanna read my Bible. I don't wanna pray. Oftentimes, this comes at the hands of discouragement in our life. And we get so discouraged and we put so much effort in just being down because we're just feeling sorry for ourselves. And we get caught in that rut of feeling sorry for ourselves. And some of you are discouraged and you're disappointed. And what really gets bad is you get to the point where you expect discouragement. You expect to be disappointed. So sure, we can try something, but it's not gonna work out. You say things like, well, life is pretty much over because of what I've gone through. There's no way, you know, anything good is gonna happen now. See, when you get discouraged, you lose your purpose. Become very inward focused upon yourself and all the things that you don't have and all the reasons why your life is not going well. And this is exactly where the enemy would have you live, but we've gotta replace those lies with God's truth. Romans 12, we've gotta renew our minds with God's truth. And so, listen, I'm not gonna uh, be able to do this, kind of rings in your mind. I'm not gonna be able to do it for whatever reason. It's not gonna work out. Then we've gotta replace that with God's truth. And we say, no, 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 no. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. 
We gotta say, no, 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 I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We say, no, 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 I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, our Lord, right? We replace the lie with the truth. We say things like, this won't ever happen, right? This is not gonna ha- happen, and so we replace that thought with the truth. Psalm 77, 14 says, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Galatians 6, 9 says, do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. So I can't give up. I can't let discouragement win. I will reap a harvest. I will keep on serving. I will keep on singing praises. I will keep on believing in the God who performs miracles. Amen? Who are you to limit God's plan? Who are you to say, God, you're not gonna be able to do it? If you have a pulse, God has a plan. And so we've gotta break ourselves out of the discouragement. We've gotta trust. We've gotta break ourselves out of the exhaustion and begin to trust and embrace God's call on our life. And then finally, I think what Peter struggles with here is exactly what you and I struggle with, is our experience, right? I've already tried it. What does he say? Lord, (laughs) we've been out, we've already been out. You know, I'm a professional fisherman, Lord. I know you're a carpenter, but in our world, you don't go back out. The fish aren't biting. Um, You definitely don't go out into the deep end. That's just not where they're at in the evening, Lord. Let me just tell you, Lord, good idea, but let me just fill you in on something. It's not gonna work. I've already tried. Have you ever ever had that conversation with God? Have you ever tried to to have that conversation where you say, God, I, I know your word says this, but FYI, Lord, FYI, all-knowing creator of the universe, eternal God, it's just not gonna work. Hmm, we have, be honest. You've said it, you've thought it. Your experience has kept you from doing what God wants you to do today. It's kept you from living the way that God wants you to live today. Some of you have said, I've tried the church thing. It didn't work out. I know what your word says, but I tried it. I tried the small group thing, I didn't fit in. So it just doesn't work for me, God. I've tried to live the right way, but you know what, God? My life got harder, so it didn't work. So I'm just gonna ease on back into a life of comfort. See, our past experience can keep us from the future blessings that God wants us to experience. We've gotta be reminded that God isn't finished with us. He's not finished with you. God isn't done because of your age. He isn't finished because of your mistakes. He's not finished because of your problems today. So be self-aware. Ask the Lord today, what is it, God? What is it? Is it it, I'm tired? Am I discouraged? Lord, is it just my experience that's keeping me from being obedient to you today? What is it for you? Peter experienced all of this, but... He decided to obey, and we saw what happened. I think the next point is your obedience precedes the blessing. Your obedience precedes the blessing. God was about to show him something. God was about to do miracles in his life. God was, God was doing incredible things to, to, to call him to purpose, but he had to be obedient in order to experience the blessing that God was gonna give to him. You see, our commitment is gonna come before the blessing. Peter's saying, even though I'm tired, even though I'm discouraged, even though my experience says it's not gonna work, I'm gonna, verse five, take you at your word. That's faith. That's faith. I'm not gonna let discouragement win. I'm gonna take you at your word and I'm gonna believe that I'm more than a conqueror, that you have purpose for me. I'm gonna take you at your word that I need to be in godly relationships I'm gonna take you at your word that I need the word. So I'm gonna start reading and praying and and pursuing you, Jesus. I'm gonna take you at your word. So I'm gonna keep on singing my praise to God. Too many times 
We beg God to do a miracle, but we simply aren't doing our part. We just want the pain to go away. We want the problem to go away, but our obedience always comes before the blessing. Peter says, I'm reluctant, but at your word, Lord, I'll do it. I'll be obedient. What if this was your attitude? What if this is how you operated? I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna take you at your word. I'll serve somewhere. I'll take you at your word. I'll help others. I'll take you at your word and and I'll read my Bible. I'll take you at your word and I will share my story. I will invite people to church. I will bring Jesus into the conversation. We would begin to see God do some incredible things in and through our life just simply by taking him at his word. Peter is fortunate. It doesn't always happen like this when we're obedient, but pretty quickly he sees the blessing, right? He sees this incredible catch of fish, so much fish that their nets began to break. So many fish that they had to call their buddies over in another boat to come help them uh, deal with the catch. So much uh, fish that their boats began to actually sink. Now listen, some of you are waiting on God to break the nets, but you haven't started fishing yet. You haven't started. Oh God, I need a miracle. God, you know, break the nets, but you haven't started fishing. You're waiting on God to do something, but you're not doing your part. What I love about the story is it reminds me of the resources and the ability of God to break the nets in our life. We serve a God who loves to break nets, who loves to sink boats because his blessings are so rich and full and overwhelming that we've got to call friends over to help us deal with all the amazing experiences and blessings that God wants to give to us. Be obedient today. Wait for the Lord to provide. Uh, Again, the, 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 the blessing for Peter happened pretty quickly. You might be in a season of waiting and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm serving, I'm, I'm doing my part. But we always reap in one season and, 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 and actually we sow in one season and then we reap in another season, right? That's the law of the harvest. You plant seeds today and then you're not, you're not gonna see immediate growth. You're not gonna see immediate fruit. It takes time. And so keep, keep taking care of those seeds. Keep being obedient. Keep doing what you know to do. And eventually that season of planting will end and you'll begin to see the fruit and then there'll be a season of harvest. There'll be a season to gather the fruit that that all of your obedience and the blessing of God wants to give to you. And that's the fun season. We always wanna stay in that season, right? But every season has a beginning and an ending, Right, and so you might be in a season of waiting and hardship and you're like, I'm ready for this one to get over, Trent. I get it. You might be in a season of gathering and everything is going great and there's just so much fruit. Enjoy it, praise God. One day it will end and you'll enter a new season. But either way, our obedience, right, is gonna precede the blessing. Number four, I think what we learn here is that the call to follow Jesus is an invitation to join his mission. It's an invitation to join the mission of God, right? In verses 10 and 11, from now on, you will be catching men, right? He gives them this incredible experience and lesson to teach them this point. You're gonna follow me because I wanna teach you how to catch men. The call to follow Jesus is not just a get out of hell free card. It's not just a simple uh, salvation call. That's a great piece of it right? We get heaven, amen, absolutely. But Jesus is calling us to follow him so that we would be a part of his mission to make disciples. The invitation was to go fishing, but Jesus is doing much bigger and greater things in the life of Peter in this moment. He's preparing these men for their purpose. He's revealing who he was. He's building their faith. And in the same way, as you are obedient to the Lord in in, in joining his mission, he'll prepare you, he'll develop you. He'll reveal more of himself to you. He'll build your faith as well. You know, you, you and I, we thought it was just an invitation to go to heaven, but Jesus is doing something bigger and greater in your life, right? You thought it was an invitation to join a small group, but Jesus is doing something bigger and greater in your life. 
You thought it was a simple conversation with a coworker, but Jesus is doing something bigger and greater in your life. And that bigger and greater thing is transformation. He wants to transform your thinking. He wants to transform your life. Right? He wants to bless you. And that goal for him is just a deeper level of understanding and blessing and experience with him. Peter calls him master in verse five, but by verse eight, he's calling him Lord. He's realized that he's the Messiah. This is his commitment day. This is his salvation day. This is the day he realized that he was a sinner and then he's committing to follow Jesus. He doesn't understand the whole making disciples point. He doesn't understand Jesus's point when he says, from now on, you're gonna catch men in that day. At this point, he just recognizes him as Messiah and he's committed to follow him for the rest of his life. And that's how you came to Christ. That's how I came to Christ. But over time, we must grow, we must mature. We learn more about the New Testament and what the word of God tells us to do and how the church is involved, how he's designed us for a bigger purpose. And as we grow, we begin to realize that yes, I am saved, but I wasn't just saved to be a spectator. I was saved to get in the game. I was saved because God has a purpose for me. I was saved to make a difference. I was saved to invest in the lives of other people around me so that they might find hope in Jesus as well. This is the goal. This is the transforming part of the mission of God. We don't start there, but we grow in that until we grasp it fully and we begin to make disciples ourselves. Now, when we hear a little bit about that, it is scary. Verse 10, Jesus says, listen, don't be afraid. (laughs) Why does he say that? Because they're afraid. We're afraid of the call that God has on our life. And we're tempted to think we're not good enough. Just like Moses, when God called Moses to go to speak to Pharaoh, he said, listen, God, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. Send somebody else. We do the same thing. We argue, fuss, and fight with God. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. And God says, no, 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 no. I'm calling you. I've gifted you. Right? The call to obedience is first a commitment to make Jesus the Lord of your life. That means that you make him the leader of your life. It it, it makes him the king of your life. And so you commit to follow him, live for him. You accept that his death on the cross is your forgiveness, that he rose from the grave, defeating sin and death. And we ask God to forgive us of our sin and we commit to follow Jesus and he gives us the gift of salvation. This is what we're seeing happen here. Peter is saying that he is a sinner. He's confessing his sin. And and Jesus says, when they get back onto the shore, hey, from now on, you're gonna catch men. And what do these guys do in verse 11? They leave everything everything, and they follow him. From now on, you're gonna be catching men. I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna follow you, Jesus. It's simple faith. You may not know what it means. You may not understand fully how he's gonna use you. Of course you don't. But we simply take the next step of faith that we know God is calling us to take today. And then tomorrow we take the next step and we live in obedience. Why? Because this is the mission of God. As we are faithful, people come to faith in Jesus. As we are faithful to serve other people, then together as a church, we see people accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. We see them walk through the waters of baptism. We see them going through base camp and camp two and camp three and leadership summits and getting involved in small group and serving in student ministries and going on overseas trips and and, and, and leading small groups. And now all of a sudden their influence and their impact is actually, actually working and God is using them to make a difference in other people's lives, right? This calling is why we as a church are a multi-site church. We created the Knoxville location out of this heartbeat to fulfill the mission of God, to multiply so that we could make more disciples. Now, oftentimes when we use the word missions in church, uh, if you grew up in church, it might immediately make you think of overseas missionaries, right? That's sometimes where our mind goes. But listen to me, mission work is anytime we are catching men, anytime we are fishing to make disciples. The Knoxville location is a direct result of being a missionary-minded church. That's why we invested financially so much into it. 
Missionary-minded means we are sending, trained, and called men and women to be disciple makers, to start this church and connect that community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why we go. Now, some of you um, might feel called to be a part of a, a new start like that. Some of you might actually live in Knoxville. We would love for you to participate in that ministry. We would love for you to join that community, like serving any other um, ministry, students or whatever. God might be calling you to serve our Knoxville location, that God might send you there in order to make more disciples. We would love to see that. You might say, well, then I would have to watch you on video, Trent. I'm telling you, 99% of this room is looking at these two screens today. <laughs> I've got about three or four rows right here. Outside of y'all, I look better up there anyway. Now, we stream the sermon to Knoxville not because we don't have gifted speakers. We stream the sermon to be intentional for our staff there so that they have time to actually pastor. Um, the majority of my week, at least half, sometimes more, is dedicated to creating a sermon. <laughs> like that's, that's a lot of time invested into being able to preach the gospel every week. And, and so Pastor Taylor, um, with this model, he's able to use his time to lead our small group ministry and our, all of our journey classes. And he's able to actually do pastoral care to all the people that are there and shepherd them. He's able to lead his staff and lead the special events that we have. He's able to lead his own small group. And he wouldn't be able to do that if he had to spend over half of his week getting up to preach a message. And so it's an intentional strategy, right? And so I, I just wanna encourage you with that. Like, this is one of the greatest things our church has ever done. And uh, we're, we're praying that God uses it uh, to bless that city and community. Just like Maryville has grown, Knoxville is growing leaps and bounds and the need is great. If you're from the North and you're like, I don't really get it, there's churches everywhere. <laughs> like, you know, why would we plant more churches? We need more healthy gospel-centered churches. Yeah, and there's a lot of dead churches in this area that aren't really committed to the next gen and aren't committed to make disciples. And so that's why we feel this burden and calling to be a multi-site church so that, so that our structure and what God has done here in Maryville can be replicated in other communities. See, the church is the missionary outpost in a community. That is the hope of the community, is the gospel in that church. And if it's not doing its job, then there is no hope. God chose the church to be the group of people who would share the love of God, connect to the people of God, and equip for the mission of God. And that's what we are called to do. So here's my question. What's it gonna take for you to get involved in God's mission? What's it gonna take? For Peter, James, and John on this day, all it took was a good fishing day. A good day on the sea, catching a lot of fish, and that's all it took. They saw a miracle. God used it in their life, and they left everything to follow Jesus. Think about that. The greatest catch that they've ever experienced Maybe that could have fed their family for months if they would have went back and sold that, but we don't see that. They left it. They left it to follow Jesus. See, every Christian is called to engage the mission of God. But what does that actually look like for us? Let me, let me get real practical here. Wherever you work, are you willing to bring Jesus into the conversation? It could look like that. What's the mission of God look like for you? Well, wherever you're at, are you willing to invite people to church? Pretty simple. Whoever you're talking to, are you willing to share your story of faith, how you came to know Jesus? Being on mission, wh whoever needs encouragement, are you willing to point them to Jesus in that encouragement? Are you willing to lead a small group? That's disciple making. Are you willing to mentor someone? Again, that's disciple making. This is what it begins to look like practically in our life. You know, we're five weeks away from Easter. Uh, it's a lot earlier this year, five weeks away. And that is the perfect greatest time to invite people to church because even for people that don't really go to church, it's kind of like the C&E crowd, Christmas and Easter, we go twice a year. And so this is a perfect time for us to take advantage 
of something that we've used uh, several times in the history of our church. And it's just simply, we just call it invite your one. Invite your one. And the whole idea and strategy is that you would, you would actually um, think of one non-Christian in your life and you would commit to pray for that non-Christian every single day and that you would intentionally seek to invite them to our Easter service uh, that weekend, right? And that one person becomes your focus, right? I wanna encourage you to invite your one. I wanna encourage you to choose somebody in your life today, some non-Christian family member, um, coworker, neighbor, whoever it is, and just begin to pray for them every single day that God would open up their 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 eyes to the truth and, 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 and begin to send that invitation to them. Next week, we're gonna begin to give some invite cards. We're gonna have some yard signs as well that you're gonna be able to use. Everything that we post on social media, you'll be able to share that uh, to your friends to, to use that to invite. W whatever we can in order to equip you and give you some resources to actually use those invitations. You know, I, I like to use those invitations, a business size uh, card invitation like, when I'm at a restaurant and you're, you know, striking up conversations with the person who is, is serving you. And, and then at the end of the meal, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna give them your card and you're gonna give them a really good tip, right? And then you can put that business card in, in, in that envelope and you can say, hey, love for you to uh, visit Foothills Church this season if you're not going to church anywhere. The only, the only key to that is don't be, giving, don't be going cheap because then you give the church a bad name. If you're giving that 10% tip, it's like, mm -mm, it's got to be, it's got to be good, 20 and above, and then, and then put the card in there. Going through a drive-through, like to invite the person there. At work, I just keep them in my back pocket. So um, at at any time, if you're at work or in any setting and you're having a conversation with someone, you can, you know, hey, here's a, here's a card and gives details and whatever we can do to to get the word out to encourage people to be a part of God's church. God's gonna bless your prayers. I've seen it time and time again. This past year, one person I was praying for for over a year was attending our church and I was meeting with from time to time. He gave his life to Christ and was baptized in December and God answers prayer, folks. He's, he's on the move in this community. He, he, wants, to, he wants to work in, your, in our midst. He wants to break the nets. You gotta be obedient. You gotta be faithful. We'll see him do it. It's not just fishing. It's a call to obedience. You see, people are hungry for the truth. They're hungry for the word. You and I, we're gonna be reluctant. We gotta push through the reluctance. The Lord wants to bless us. And so we've gotta be obedient so that we would join him in his mission. He's inviting us to be a part of this mission. If you decide to take Jesus at his word, if you decide to obey him and do the simple thing that you know to do today, and then tomorrow you do the next thing, you're gonna to begin to see the hand of God move on your behalf. You'll see him do things that don't make sense. You'll see him grow you in ways you never imagined. You'll see him take care of you. And like Peter, you're gonna grow in humility and in faith, and you're gonna recognize more and more just how astonishing and amazing our God actually is. We can do it. And we're gonna do it as a church together. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for this story. And God, we wanna ask that you would help us to push through our reluctance, to push through the exhaustion of building our kingdom and recognize that we've gotta give energy to your kingdom. Lord, that you would help us to push through the discouragement and not allow discouragement to, to, to isolate ourselves and to make us just inward focused and and, and just feel sorry for ourselves. Pull us out of that darkness, Lord. God, give us hope that, that even though we're tired or discouraged, that you wanna work through us. And despite our own hangups, despite our own mistakes and our past experiences, God, you still wanna work in us. So give us faith today to take you at your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand and sing. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like this video and leave a comment. We'd also like to encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss an upload from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, you can go to our website, foothillschurch.com, or by clicking the link in the description below.